All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Good Soul Church. I'm Dave. I'm the pastor here. I see some new faces in the room. I love that. I always love seeing new people. And uh, welcome. Welcome to our home. Welcome to uh, church. Um, we are doing church in our home, and I just love that we can do that. Good morning. Great to see you. And um, we, we love to see people walk into this place one way and walk out another. That is our goal, is to... Um, welcome Jesus into the room and so that he can change lives and change hearts. So I hope that when you came in, you got to grab a cup of coffee maybe, shook a hand, hug somebody, somebody, you got a new name maybe, um, but that's what we do after as well. We fellowship after church, so you're more than welcome to stay after and meet some new people and, and have some good food. Um, our goal is to create an environment where God's spirit is present. And so we're going to preach out of God's word, we're going to open with worship and prayer, always invite the Holy Spirit into the room so that hearts can be changed. And uh, every week it feels like that is what has happened. We've had people walk out of here, you know, give their lives to Christ. We've baptized people. We've seen people read their Bible for the first time, really engage with God, maybe in a real way for the first time. And that's our hope every weekend. And um, so I just hope today's message, though, um, I've been praying over it a lot, that it really penetrates your heart, um, that God meets you right where you're at, and as we talk about this book of Acts that we're going through right now, that, that you see why we planted this church. And so uh, we are starting, um, we, we started last week, but we're kind of into this study that I'm calling the first church. So when we started this church eight months ago, we had prayed for over a year about what this church would look like. And a lot of what we gathered of what we're going to do is out of Acts. And so we said, hey, you know, Jesus was resurrected. And uh, then all these disciples, these 120 people in this room, they did something. Why did they do what they did? And now that we're 2,000 years later, how far have we moved from that? And we need to get back to what it was. Because of all the people, these people that were with Jesus would know how Jesus wanted church to be done. So um, so that's, uh, that's what we're doing. So we're going through the book of Acts pretty much for the whole fall. We're going to be in it for a couple months. And we're going to go through, not line by line, but really chapter and verse by verse and try to figure out what the church should look like. Um, and so one of our theme verses for our church, not just for this study, is out of Jeremiah. And it says this, Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. And so this is Jeremiah speaking to the, the nation of Israel saying, hey, God gave you a path, God gave you rules, God gave you things to do, and you're walking away from it, come back to the ancient path. And they didn't. And this uh, leads into an exile that takes them out of the promised land. And, and so our goal as a church is to find those ancient paths, find the ways that God wanted to do, so we can have rest for our souls. And so uh, we, uh, we want to remember the miracles of God from the Old Testament. Those are real, and they're true, and uh, they shape our faith. Um, but we uh, we got to figure out where to learn about what church is, and it's out of the Holy Scriptures, out of the Bible. And uh, one of the reasons we think that is because Timoth uh, Paul wrote this to Timothy um, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God's Word is going to teach us to become more righteous, become more like Jesus, so that we can do good things that he's already set out ahead of us to do. And that's what we want to do as a church. Is we want to always look back, God, how can we get better so that we can do all these good works that you've set out for us? Um, and so we study the Bible to find some answers for certain things. How God wants us to live as a people, as a family, as an individual. What his promises were and still are for us. Okay, His promises are still alive and true. Um, how we should conduct ourselves in a fallen and broken world. We study Daniel and Babylon and a righteous Jewish boy living the right way in a broken culture, which I think we can all relate. We're in a broken culture right now. Um, and what his ultimate plan is for humanity. We can also learn about what his intention for the church was, right? So because uh, church has become a bunch of different things for a bunch of different people, not being raised in the church, when I entered church at 21, I was highly critical of church. And so I saw some things that maybe people who had been raised in church their whole lives like didn't see. And I was like, why are we doing that? And what, what is that purpose of that? And I was trying to figure out exactly what church should look like. And, um, and I think right when Jesus left, he left a group of disciples who knew 
God's heart. And everything started becoming clear to them how they should start church. And so we're going to talk through Acts, what that looked like. Um, it's just, this is what the book of Acts is. It is really this section of time from Jesus' resurrection. Eight chapters in, we meet Paul. We're going to get there in a minute. But these first seven chapters are really what the disciples thought they should do. And they were following Jesus and the Holy Spirit's instruction on that. And um, it's an incredible reference point for us to, to walk through Acts and figure it out. Um, no church is ever going to be perfect, and the reason for that is because of us. Um, we are all sinful people. We all are going to mess up. There's always going to be people involved in leadership and other things. Um, so the church is never going to be perfect. It would be if we weren't in it. But God in included us into the church, and, uh, and uh, he wanted his people there. But we should always be on this pursuit of righteousness and this pursuit of holiness and to make things uh, better. And so I want our church to be a church that stands apart from maybe even other churches. Uh, other churches that um, maybe have gotten caught up in culture and gotten caught up in like, you know, um, uh, watering down the gospel. And we're not going to ever water down the gospel here. I wrote it this way. The church should be a light on a hill, scriptural, but it should bring help to the hurting and hope to the hopeless. If your church doesn't do these things, then you're not acting as the church should act. You might have a really nice club that you're a part of. There's too many social clubs in America that are just enjoying each other and enjoying potlucks and enjoying things together. But we need to bring hope to people. We need to bring help to people. And, um, and that's what we're going to do as Good Soul Church. It should be a place full of grace and truth. And that's something we're going to speak truth. But there's grace in it. Some people lean too heavy on the grace side and they never give the truth. And the woman at the well who was in sin, Jesus corrected her, told her not to sin again, but didn't condemn her. And those are very important that we do those together, grace and truth, but never holding back on either. Um, so as we slowly walk through Acts, I want us to see um, how the disciples thought of God. They were very confused, and keep that in mind. These disciples were fishermen, they weren't super well educated, and so they were confused the whole time they were with Jesus. And all of a sudden, things became clear. That's what we're going to talk about today in Acts 2. Um, but their ultimate purpose is what we should keep as our ultimate purpose, and that make, is that making Jesus famous. Our goal is to make Jesus famous. He is the answer to all of our questions, and he's the main thing. We're always going to have Jesus at the center of everything. I'm not the center of this. No ministry that we're going to be a part of is the center of it. Jesus is the center of everything we're doing. Um, so I want to talk about Acts for a second, because when you get into Acts, you know, everyone's got a different take on Acts. And so I just want to give you a couple things, some caveats. So people say... Um, Books of the Bible are either prescriptive or descriptive. I don't know if you've heard those terms before. I want to go over them, though, real quick. So prescriptive means these are marching orders for the church. Follow these directions. Do not deviate from this. This is how it's supposed to be done. Okay? Descriptive is describing something that happened in the Bible that isn't necessarily for the New Testament church to do exactly that way. Okay? So things like this would be Levitical law. The Jews... Uh, the Israelite people had laws that they had to follow to separate themselves from the culture around them. That's like the, you don't wear, you know, a fabric of two different threads and don't eat pork. Those things, right? We hear those. Well, those are descriptive about that people. It's a Levitical law for the Jewish people in that day. Those are not laws that we have to maintain anymore. Now, there's some righteousness in that. And is there some holiness to step into some of those? Yes, I agree. But um, that is more descriptive. Prescriptive would be, um, you know, do not murder. That's probably a prescriptive thing. We should not do that today. Yeah. And there's a bunch of things. So, when people ask me, is Acts prescriptive or descriptive? Um, yes. The answer is yes. It's both of those things. So, and uh, I'm gonna, I say that because we get into some things in Acts that might have been for the church then. It might have been uh, for them. But, uh, but there's a lot that's still for our church today. Um, and I say this because when I describe Acts 2, depending on your background, you have different responses to Acts 2. So, if you're, uh, if you're some of my friends who don't read the Bible, you're brand new to faith, you, uh, you don't know what we're talking about, um, when I say Acts 2, you're like, well, how many Acts does this thing have? I don't know, like, what, what kind of play we're in? Is this Hamilton? I don't know, right? Like, what kind, of, what kind of thing are we talking about? How many Acts, right? If you're my more charismatic friends and you were raised in a church that leaned into the power of God through miracles and mighty works and the prophetic... You get excited about this chapter, Acts 2, because this is when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples and just miracles broke out. The power of God in a mighty way. Okay? So that's my more charismatic friends. So 
My more conservative Christian friends, if you were raised in a, a home or a church uh, that was more conservative, you, you think of Acts and you're like, okay, great, Holy Spirit power, awesome. And then you jump to the second half where Peter's sermon is so on point. He's got three points. And then, um, and then at the very end, we break into small groups, and we have our small groups and our life groups, and that's how the church grows. Well, you're both right. Uh, all three of you are right, actually. I'm so glad all three of you are in the room, because I think you're going to like how we present it today, in that we um, got, yes, descriptive and prescriptive. And, um, and so, no matter what camp you fall into, I'm so glad you're here. I want to make sure you know what this study is and what it is not of Acts, okay? So the study of the book of Acts, what we're doing right now, is the study of the early church. It's to evaluate how God would want us to grow as a church, a good soul church, okay? This is not a study of the gifts of the Spirit. Whole. I promise you, I'm going to do a Holy Spirit study where we talk about gifts. There's many gifts. There's not just the gifts we're going to talk about today. There's many gifts of the Holy Spirit. God is powerful. Miracles do happen. Being in the medical world, I have seen healings happen. So, um, but this is not a study of that, okay? So, so as, I, as I go over this um, uh, today, I want you to see that um, it is descriptive and prescriptive, and we're going to see the power of God fall, but it's not a study of that moment, okay? And then um, I want us to continue to study how the power of God shaped the church. And so I don't want to get too hyper-focused on individual miracles today or over the next couple of weeks because... Oh, it's very nice. That's a moment, isn't it? Um, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, never mind. It's a, it's a, this is going to be a study of um, the power of God and miracles. So, uh, uh, all right, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, I'm corrected. Jesus, I have received correction. Uh, no, so, um, <laughs> but I do want to quickly tell you kind of what we stand for as a church, so you know where we stand doctrinally on all of this. Um, I believe the God who spoke the universe into existence in a word can still do all of that today. A God did not lose power. He did not lose the ability to perform miracles or healings. I've seen all of it performed. I've seen all of it um, done. And um, it's documented in the Bible for a reason. It's something for us to press into and to believe God for. And so if you're believing for a miracle, if you're believing for healing, God can do it. He didn't lose any power. Um, we, we do not believe in cessationism, which means that nothing of that time was meant for today. God is still moving in powerful ways. And I think we would all agree that looking at our world today, um, we need miracles. Like, the culture is falling apart, and uh, a revival needs to happen, and miracles need to happen. People's lives need to be radically changed, as we're going to see in the disciples today. And that's the only thing that's going to save this world is radical life change. And the reason I say God did not change is because um, he says he didn't change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The God who spoke the world into existence did not stop performing miracles in a moment in time. It doesn't make any sense. And anyone who's ever been on a mission trip or been like praying for people who needed God desperately, things happen, miracles happen. So um, we believe this, and we're going to continue to press into that but I just want to let us know that today is what did the church do when the Holy Spirit fell, changed lives, and what was the next step? Okay? So um, let's jump into Acts 2. You guys ready? Here we go. Acts 2 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Stop. All right, verse 1. We're going to spend some time in here. So I want you to understand this. So remember, we talked about Jesus said, stay put. That was the last thing we saw in Acts 1. Stay put. And we talked last week about just go back to what God told you last. What did God tell you to do? And he told the disciples, go back, stay put. The Holy Spirit's coming. I'm leaving. <coughs> you need the Holy Spirit to do anything else that you're going to do. And so um, when I read this, I hope, as I'm trying to teach you how to learn your Bible and read your Bible, some questions come up for you, okay? Where was this place? We talked about that, right? We talked about the upper room. They went back to the place. They last were with Jesus. And John Mark's home, likely. And they're all together. There's probably 120 of them at this point. And then your other question should be, what's this? What does Pentecost mean? Because we have to understand that to understand what the whole thing um, is going to say. Because I want to teach you that the Bible is one big narrative. God, men could not have written this when you see some of the connections here. Men could not have made this up in the middle of the desert in Israel 2,000 years ago. They couldn't have written this down and had all the things put together. So what is Pentecost? Everybody's like, oh, that's 
That's a Christian holiday when the Holy Spirit came to the upper room, you know, tongues of fire, all that, right? I'm like, no, it's actually not. It is. Now, it's an adopted Christian holiday um, because the term Pentecost actually is a Greek term, Pentecoste, which means 50th. And it actually refers to the Feast of Weeks, which is Shavuot, which is a Jewish festival. So the Feast of Shavuot is um, the, the feast seven weeks after Passover. So Passover happens, remember, the, the, uh, they wiped the blood over the door frames. Egypt, uh, God said we're going to kill every firstborn in Egypt except for the Israelite people. God protected the Israelite people. That's Passover, okay? Right after Passover, um, Pharaoh let them leave Egypt. You have the Exodus, and you have a week in the wilderness where they took unleavened bread because they didn't have time to put yeast in the bread. And so you have uh, unleavened bread for one week, and 49 days later, seven weeks after Passover, and it's considered the day after Passover, so it's 50 days, is Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Weeks, seven weeks, which is in Greek the word Pentecost, okay? So I want you to understand that this happened a thousand years before this moment we're going to talk about today, okay? And it's really important for us to see. This uh, Shavuot was the actual festival. We started with barley. Um, uh, at Passover, you started harvesting barley, and then you uh, harvested your wheat, and then you celebrated. So this is a celebration, a time of gladness, a time of cheer in Israel, right? We're celebrating the harvest. That's what the Feast of Weeks is. And, um, and you can actually see it in Deuteronomy. It says this. Count off seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Then celebrate the festival of weeks to the Lord, your God, by giving a free will offering, offering in proportion to the blessings the Lord, your God, has given you. This is in Deuteronomy. You see this also in uh, Leviticus. And so you have this time, this 50-day period after Passover, um, a counting down of Shavuot, which actually ended up being at the Mount Sinai, the law, the Torah, was given to the people on day 50, on Pentecost, on Shavuot. So God did this, this celebration in Israel that was there for a long time, all of a sudden became a representation of God um, sacrificing a lamb over the doorway, saving the people, a week out of, um, of just running from Pharaoh, and then 50 days later, you have the Feast of Weeks. So I wrote it up here for you. So Passover. God sparing the Israelite people in Egypt when all the firstborn were killed. The Feast of Unleavened Bread for a week celebrating the exodus from Egypt where they ate bread that they did not put yeast into. They carried it with them. They had to run quickly. And then the Feast of Weeks is seven weeks after Passover. They go to Mount Sinai and they get the law of God. This is a thousand years before this moment in Acts 2. Okay? So um, Leviticus 23 talks about the Jewish festival. And it describes these in detail. You can go back and read through these. But I would tell you this. Jesus celebrated Passover. The Last Supper is Passover. The following day, Jesus was a sacrificial lamb that covered the sins of the Jewish people in that moment, the day after. <clears throat> Jesus leaves 40 days later. He walks with his people 40 days. 50 days later is Pentecost. They're in the upper room when everything we're about to talk about about happens. Um, God's timing is perfect. Man's is not. They did not know what was going to happen 50 days after. These guys, Jesus left at 40 days. For 10 days, they're hiding in this upper room, just praying, seeking God all together in a moment. And at day 50, God comes. The fact that everything lines up so perfectly in the Bible, written by a bunch of different authors over the course of like a thousand years, um, Old Testament, New Testament, AD 100, it all ends, all the writing ends of the Bible, and then it's all perfectly spelled out, perfectly timed, all the seasons, everything is perfectly done, just shows you God wrote it, shows you that God, it's all inspired by God. So um, Jesus walked into Jerusalem the week before Passover, so he had a, a Passover week, and they celebrated with his disciples knowing that he was going to the cross the next day. Um, the Holy Spirit showed up in Acts 2, which we're going to read out in a second. And it, it puts all of this together for me. Um, God came to the mountain, um, the fire and the cloud of God um, descended onto the mountain, and then was with the Israelite people from then on. So, um, Acts 2, 2-4 says this, 
Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Acts 2, 2-4. The description here is incredible. The power of God descended into the room and is described as a wind. The breath of God, in Hebrew is ruach. And it just means like the power of God is moving through. It's the same word that's hovering over the deep before creation. It's ruach. It's just this wind, this breath of God. The fire settled onto each person. Imagine that, just the look of that, okay? It sounds like imagery we've heard before, though. So the Holy Spirit is like a wind and a fire. But it's the same description, the same words as God's cloud, his fire, his covering the mountain. And, um, and then this pillar of fire in the temple, and God's presence comes in and sits in the temple, right? So, so Exodus 40, 34 and 38 describes it this way. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, which is the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night. So at night, this cloud that hung over the tabernacle um, was there, and it lit up everything in the sight of all the Israelites during all of their travels. And I want to show you this picture. I showed this a couple months ago about the tabernacle. This is what, before they had the, the Jerusalem mount, and they built the temple, you know, the Solomon built the temple, this is what they built to, to host the presence of God in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And this, this fire, this smoke, hung here all day. And at night it lit up with fire. So the presence of God is in the tabernacle, in the temple. Okay? And I just want you to remember this as we step into what happened in Acts. And then, um, then Solomon finally finished the temple, right? And it's on the, t- uh, the Temple Mount. Second Chronicles 7.1 says this, When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, which is in the front of the temple, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Second Chronicles seven one. The reason Jesus said it was better for him to go, because Jesus was human, He's fully God, fully human, but he could only be in one place at one time. Jesus needed us to be walking with the presence of God, like the Israelites did through all their journeys through the desert, um, to be able to complete the Acts one eight Great Commission. He knew that when the Holy Spirit would come, he could physically be with every single person on the planet who knew God. So the new temple, where this fire and this smoke and this cloud comes, and God's presence, is actually you. So this is what happens in the upper room. Acts 2 describes these believers who, for the first time, um, God entered them and indwelled them with the Holy Spirit. The presence of God moved from the tabernacle to the temple into the believers. And when that happened, um, God was able to move through each believer to the entire world to actually complete the Great Commission. Because I think last week we all said, well, how in the world am I supposed to go reach the ends of the world? Well, you can't, but you with the power of God can. And, um, and now since his presence resides in the new temple, which is your body, he's no longer fixed to one location. The temple couldn't move off the temple mount. The tabernacle could only move when God moved and they had to chase after kind of the presence of God. But now each one of us, as believers, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And you actually have the same power that they had in that moment um, dwelling within you. So God had this command for us, this Acts 1-8 command, to go to all the ends of the world and tell the good news of the gospel. And after this moment, they had the power to do it. So these normal men, in a moment of God's presence, were filled with power and courage like they never had before. But they also see something unusual, right? This is what I want to address. They are speaking in different tongues. Um, And what I want to focus on next is how God used this incredible gift um, and how that kind of all goes along with all these festivals and this time of year and what was going on um, to make a huge impact in the people around them. So, here we go. Acts 2, 5 through 13, it says this. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Wait, I thought you had to go to every nation, right? No, God brought all the nations to you. Um, When they heard this sound, and this is the sound of the Holy Spirit falling, and that that power that might in the upper room, and then the speaking of other languages, other tongues. Um, When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because they heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, 
aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Aren't they all from right here? And then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? I'm going to read all these. Um, we'll see how it goes. All right. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, uh, Cretans and uh, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. So first, this is the first documented gift of tongues we see in the Bible. And in this particular instance, it went like this. It's like as if I started speaking German right now perfectly. But I did not know what I was saying. And all my Germans in the room were like, what? I didn't know Pastor Dave spoke German. Come on. Like, you know, and you're like getting a word from me. Like I'm reading German out of the Bible. And you're like, yeah, Pastor Dave speaks German. This is amazing. It's clear for the first time. And then all you people who don't speak German are like, Dave's going crazy. Like, and Dave might have, you know, been doing some stuff before service. Like, that's what, that's what this feeling is, right? So all the Germans in the crowd are saying, the power of God. Like, I'm hearing God's word for the first time. And everybody else is like, I don't know what's going on. But there's so many languages being spoken by these 120 disciples. Everyone is being filled up. Everyone is hearing the gospel. So the bottom line is this. Um, what... What I'm saying, if I was speaking German, is powerful, but it's edifying to somebody. Somebody's receiving from that. It's good for somebody to hear the good news in that tongue that I was speaking. Um, but it's confusing for others, and it looks weird to others, and it looks like off to others, right? And so our, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to move through each of us in different gifts at different times and different levels. What I would say is um, it's always attractive. The Holy Spirit moving in a real way is powerful and attractive, um, and it's always edifying somebody. It's always filling somebody up. It's always benefiting the body in some way. And that is going to always be our discernment on gifts of the Holy Spirit in this church. I believe God moves in powerful ways, and we are expecting that. We're hoping for that. Um, but it should always be attractive. People who aren't experiencing that moment should want to experience that moment. And, um, and it should move things. Like, like you know, when the, when the Holy Spirit moves, like, powerful things should happen. And, um, and it should be encouraging to others around you. These men were not putting on a show. And that is one big thing I want to point out. Uh, they were making an eternal impact, and it was obvious. That sound, that movement, you'll see in a second what happens. Um, it changed that culture. It changed the city. It changed what was going on there. These men were being led by the Spirit, and it appeared unusual to those who weren't believers, or those who did not receive the message. I guarantee you, they were making some comments. But it impacted the right people in a mighty way. And that's how we're always going to discern the Holy Spirit. So we see God empower these men to speak different languages, but why? What's well, a good question. Why, in this moment, in this particular case, were they speaking different languages? Well... Over the past thousand years, between um, you know uh, the Israelites getting to the Promised Land and uh, and then this moment, you know, twelve hundred years later, about there had been this thing called the diaspora of Jews, and they had been exiled multiple times from the Promised Land, and Jews were placed in different empires. So they had moved over into the Mediterranean, into Europe. They moved to the Median Empire. There's an Assyrian uh, exile. We all know about the Babylonian exile with David or Daniel. And so you have these different exiles. And so in this moment, there's Jews everywhere, all over the world. But if they could, and if they weren't a slave that wasn't restricted, most were allowed to return to the Promised Land for this set of three festivals. Passover, um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Weeks. And so, during early summer, every year, during Passover and Pentecost, Jerusalem went from 20,000 Jews to about 160,000 Jews. So everything we're reading to get today happened on Pentecost, the time that God had ordained thousand years before to where all the Jews would be in one place and could hear the good news of the gospel spoken in their language by these men in the first day of the church. Um, imagine Mardi Gras. 
That's what this festival was. This was not a solemn festival. Pentecost was like, the wheat's done, we're done, everyone drinks on me. That's kind of what it felt like in Mardi Gras. And a lot of these Jews were just Jews culturally, but they knew they were supposed to do the right thing, and they were supposed to come and celebrate the festival. So, so we had this moment in this culture here, right here in Jerusalem, that all these Jews came home. And um, they heard the gospel presented on the first day of the church in their own language in a powerful way. Seems like God might have done this on purpose, right? So then Peter, who we know denied Jesus three times, kind of a you know confused guy, always asking weird questions to Jesus, um, feels like a failure. He's up in this upper room. He gets filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and he steps out onto the scene and gives the first recorded sermon of the Bible. And in that moment, the church was born. So I think as a pastor, I'm like, okay, well, what did Peter say? On the first sermon of the Bible, it's probably important for me as I'm preparing to teach you and and, and uh, you know say what's going on. So so Peter stood up. Now here we go. Acts 2, 14 and 15. It says this. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, <coughs> raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. So the first thing he says is he clears the air. It's kind of like when I stand up here, I'm like, everybody got a seat? We good? You got coffee? Everybody's settled? We're good? I'm like, make sure everyone's okay and ready to receive the news, right? If you just jump out at it, no one's ready to receive it. So, hey, let me just tell you, they're not drunk. It's only 9 in the morning. And the reason that number is important, again, God's so good in the Bible. Well, Jews were not actually allowed to drink wine until 10 a.m., like legally, in their law. They could start drinking for an early lunch, you know, and, you know, but they couldn't drink before 10. So 9 in the morning is a very specific number. Like, hey, no, it's before the time that anyone could be drunk, okay? So these are, these are believing Jews. They're, they're, they're out here um, doing this brand new thing, but they're definitely not drunk. So Peter was about to give one of the most impactful and um, monumental sermons ever given. He just made, had to make sure some things was cleared up, you know? So... Um, he made sure to clarify that the confusion that they were hearing and seeing was due to an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And so, Acts 2, 16 and 17 says this, No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. And then... Um, a couple verses later, Acts 2, 21, it says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what he did here, the first thing he did was he invoked the Old Testament prophets. And it's something we're always going to do in all of our messages. The Old Testament's important. Some guys just skip right over. But I love the fact that these feasts and these seasons and these festivals, God had already ordained them. In heaven, all of the feasts and festivals will be celebrated. You know, like, we are going to be what would be considered what Messianic Jews in heaven. Like, God loves the festivals. He loves the celebrations. It's going to be, um, you know, all these dinners and all these, because God loves it. And so, what he's saying, by going back to the Pastor Joel, or Pastor Joel, going back to the Prophet Joel, is he's saying, hey, all you young Jewish people who are here, you know the Prophet Joel. What he spoke about is happening right now. He's trying to call it to this moment. And um, he spoke boldly that the things of the past are now being fulfilled. Because we all know that Jesus was prophesied over 700 times in the Old Testament. So what he's going to start doing is saying, hey, the things that were talked about just happened. Because the Jews have a problem with the idea that the Messiah has come. Right? This is the big hang-up between Jews and Christians. If we believe the same thing they believe, we just believe God already did it. And they're like still waiting on the Messiah. Peter here is saying, hey, as a Jew... As a guy who witnessed all this, I know the Old Testament. It happened. It happened right now. So let's keep moving. So Acts 2, 22 through 24, wrote this. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves already know. He's saying, you watched all this happen. You knew Jesus. You knew he walked these streets. You knew he performed miracles. It was all prophetic. He was doing what the Old Testament said he should do. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So he identifies these Jewish pilgrims, these hundred and some thousand pilgrims, as the ones who killed Jesus. 
they probably weren't there, like, on that, you know, Good Friday. They did not actually kill Jesus. It was more likely the, the Jews in Jerusalem who called for the crucifixion and, and you know, said, you know, crucify him. It was not easy. So why do you say that? Well, he's doing something very important. He's, um, he's showing them that every one of us is actually guilty for Jesus' death. Because Jesus went to the cross for our sin. All of us have sin. So even though we didn't call for his death, we called for it with our behavior and our values and our morals. Jesus had to go to the cross for each one of us. And so in essence, they did put Jesus on the cross. So did we. And so Peter is, is pointing to the heart of people because it's so easy for people to say, that wasn't me. Oh, that's that guy's sin. You know, like, oh, he, oh he's talking about adultery today. I, no, that's not me. It's like, well, yeah, but he's also talking about lying and cheating and stealing and all the things. Sin in general. So that's what he's saying. You put him on the cross. And, um, and I love how he says this. So it like strikes to the heart of them. And then he goes back and he quotes Psalm 16. David. And all these Jews would have loved King David. They would have had a lot of the Psalms memorized, right? So Psalm 16, David says that he will die, but God will not abandon him in death. That's what the, the whole Psalm says that, right? It's so over and over, God will not abandon me in death. So then he says in Acts 2, 29, this. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is still here today. So he's saying to these people who love David, hey, David's right there. That's his tomb. He's still here. He did not conquer death because he wasn't the Messiah. And so he's pointing to this. He quoted the psalm, and he said, David's still here. Um, and then Acts 2, 30 and 31 says, but he was a prophet. And he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne, which Jesus was a descendant of David, in the line. Seeing that what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, which just happened, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. So David was prophesying about Jesus. And then Peter is bringing up a psalm they would know and flipping it on his head because he's saying, hey, David was prophesying that the Messiah would come and raise him from the dead and place him into God's kingdom. He wasn't saying he was going to do it. And the Messiah would be raised from the dead before any decay of his body. So David was saying, yeah, before the three days is up, if any body in Jerusalem would have decayed in three days, God's going to be raised, the Messiah is going to be raised, and save his people from death. And he keeps on in Acts 32, 33. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. So he's like, everything you're seeing, God, Holy Spirit, Jesus is risen, Messiah has come, and what you're seeing, you need to believe. So it's 50 days after the resurrection. The buzz in Jerusalem has got to be crazy, right? Because like 50 days before, this rabbi died, was raised, no one can find his body. All the Roman guards are out trying to find the body, trying to put down any sort of uprising. These guys have been hiding in an upper room, um, and they're doing what they're supposed to do, but you can imagine just like, there's like, you know, probably something out of a, you know, CSI, you know, Miami or something, right? They're just trying to find these guys, find what's going on. And like we talked about last week, Jesus had shown himself to over 500 people. So there's a bunch of people who knew that Jesus was resurrected. There's a bunch of people trying to like, what do we, what's next? Like, what do we do? And this is a, a, a word for our church. What do you do? When you know the truth, um, will you wait for God to move? And then you follow his directions, right? And um, 500 people were shown Jesus, and then 10 days before, about a week before, he's gone. And there's no word for 10 days. And they're all in the supper room of praying. And Peter says to all the people, you witnessed it. We all witnessed it. And now the moment has come. And then he quotes Psalm 110 this time. And it's a psalm that now we know refers to Jesus. And God placing Jesus at his right hand. And what this does is it shows the authority that Jesus had, by, by Peter saying this, Jesus is at the right hand of God, means he is the Son of God, and he did get raised in the power of his resurrection. And then in Acts 2, 36 and 37, it says this, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And that's important to include both those terms, the Jewish people. They were waiting on Messiah, and that Messiah they thought was going to be this this king who came and kind of wiped out the Romans. He's like, no, no. The Messiah came, but he looks different than you think he looks. But he's calling that you um, 
say that he is Lord, and that you bow to him. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart because they'd been waiting for the Messiah for generations. And this is the Jews that were ready. Their heart was ready. And this is a word for somebody like, sometimes you're, someone's heart's not ready to receive the good news yet. And it doesn't mean we don't present the good news, but you, you can't get frustrated if you're out there trying to you know, evangelize the people and tell people the good news if they're just not ready. Some of these Jews did not receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior in this moment. But a lot did. Um, and those were the ones whose heart was ready. They were cut to the heart because they'd seen all this evidence, but they also felt the power of God. I think that's a, a word for me because I'm all about apologetics. I'm all about giving you like biblical history and archaeology and genetics and all this stuff. But in some capacity, this is not going to convince everybody. You need a move of God and the power of God to move in a mighty way. And they were wrecked. So the season of worship, this festival that they had come to, but they were not expecting this moment. So, so they were there to worship God, but they were not expecting an actual outpouring of the power of God. But when they heard the truth, they knew it was true, and it changed everything. And their response was perfect. They heard the truth, and then a group of them said, what do we do? Brothers said, what's next? What do we do? And I love that response, because you don't know. Like, there's no direction there, and Peter's ready with an answer. And this is important for us. As someone who's going to talk about your faith at work, at school, Always be ready with the answer. You're not the answer. Jesus is the answer. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Every believer gets this Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord, our God, will call. Peter's response was clear, simple, and without hesitation. There was not some crazy sermon beyond that. It was, you're a sinner, God died for your sins, you should repent, focus on Him, get baptized like He got baptized, and then go tell other people about it. Very simple message. It's a message for our church. Very simple message. You're like, power of God changes lives, go tell other people about it. Power of God changes lives, go tell other people about it. I believe religion has clouded the simplicity of the gospel message. And maybe just pastors are trying too hard to make the gospel something that's not. But honestly, like when I came to Christ at 21, simple. It was a simple gospel. You see, the truth is, Jesus came. He lived a perfect life that we could not. He died. He was rose again. He conquered death and offered us eternal life, and it's a free gift. That's the gospel. Everyone should be able to present that to a friend. Um, Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died for us. Our sins covered. It's a free gift. You just have to receive it. When these people heard the good news for the first time, you can imagine the religion they were in. Like the, the, These were Jews who came back to a festival, so they had been raised in it. And all of a sudden, there was this life-giving good news. Like You can imagine how many people responded to that. Well, let's see how many. Acts 2, 40 and 41 says this. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So he did call out sin. He did say, hey, the culture around you is falling apart. But the message of Jesus didn't change. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000. It's incredible. 3,000 people came to Christ on the first day of the church. So Peter found himself the pastor of a megachurch on day one. <laughs> so anyone who ever puts down a megachurch, um, well, you're putting down Peter, because uh, we all know that Timothy actually spoke to about 30,000 in Ephesus. We're going to talk about next week what that became, what 3,000 became to make sure it stayed healthy. And that'll be next week. But I want you to know that if, if we don't, we have new faces in the room today. It just warms my eye, get chills next week. About it. Like, we've not had a Sunday without a new face in the room. That's incredible. If, like, if you're not excited about what's happening here and not mentioning to friends what's happening here, then the, the power of God's not there. Like, we have, we have to figure that out. Because these people, 3,000 came the first day. Now, I don't think our living room can handle 3,000. But if it happens, we'll figure it out. You know, but like, but again, but but this is a growing church. The power of God moved and 3,000 were added because people saw the good news presented in a life-giving way, a simple way for the first time. Um, and we look at the story of the first church. Some things stand out to me um, that we need to make sure are a part of our church so we can continue to have a healthy church. So first, these spirit-filled disciples, and that's important. 
uh, looked different than the world they were living in. And uh, Danielle and I have, um, for years, tried to like set ourselves apart from culture in certain ways, and anybody who knows us knows what those are, but like, but in a way that we're set apart. Not in a hoity-toity, but not in a, like, we're better than anybody way, but just a way that God could use us for the gospel. And um, what we see with these new disciples, they were different. They bust out of that upper room, and they were different. They looked different, they sounded different, they acted different. Um, when God changed their <laughs> lives in that upper room, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and everything changed in a moment. And that's the power of God. But before they could change the world, right, Acts 1-8, hey, go sit in this upper room and wait for God to change you. And so I wrote it this way. Before God can put you to work, he needs to do a work in you. And this can happen in a moment. And I'm not one of those people who thinks we need to be in you know, like two years of therapy to be able to be used by God. You might need two, two years of therapy to work through some stuff, but God can change you in a moment to make an impact. And, and some of my friends who've dealt with addictions and other things, God changed them in a moment, and they're the ones who are going to speak to the addiction in others. Now, they might still have to be in AA, and they still have to be recovering from that, but they can be used by God in a moment. But God has to do a work in your life. And once they were changed, they were no longer moving to the beat of culture. They didn't care. Right? Like they, they run out of the upper room. Peter did not care what anyone thought about his sermon. He's like, I'm going to preach. Right? And that's, I love that confidence of they knew what God had done in them. And I said, they lived in a culture, and they stood out, they stood up, and they made an incredible difference. When they burst out of the upper room, people noticed something different about them. And I wrote it this way. Our church can never look like culture. And this is a word for some pastors that I know. They're trying to look like culture to bring some more people in to give them the good news. I'm telling you, it's not effective. Because there's a better show down the road. Our church can never look like culture, but instead we should shape culture. Why is the church not setting the standard for culture? It did forever. I mean, it did for a long, long time. The center of every community was a church. Now, did religion get into that and some like things that maybe weren't healthy into that church? Yes. But the, every community that was planted, every hospital that's ever planted, every missions organization, anyone who helps the poor, feeds the hungry, was church-based for almost all of history. All of a sudden, in the you know, 20th century, all of a sudden every nonprofit has to do that. But why did the church lose ground in that? It's because it started trying to become like culture versus setting the culture. And that's what we're going to do as Good Soul Church. We're going to not deviate on our beliefs. We're going to try to set culture here in Wellington, Florida. There's going to be something different about us. Um, we should impact the community around us in a positive way. This Wellington should know Good Soul Church exists, not because I'm awesome, not because of some cool outreach we did, because of the impact we make every single day. Everyone at my work knows that I'm the pastor of Good Soul Church and that we have a church at our house that we're, you know, and, and a lot of people have come because I don't hold back in telling people about the good news of Jesus. And all of us have that ability to do it in our work, in our schools, um, but you have to be equipped to do it, and that's what my job is. Um, so the outpouring of the Holy Spirit should impact culture and impact your city. When Peter started speaking, he did not spend hours debating political nuanced topics of the day, you know, like, oh, well, where, do we, where do we lie on this social issue? He didn't do that. He presented the gospel simply, clearly, and without um, any apology. And that's what we're going to do. And I said it this way. The message of the church should be simple and life-changing. We should never shy away from the message of the church. Because it's the message of, like, hope and healing. Uh, it's a message of redemption. And so many people need that right now. At Good Soul Church, I will always present the gospel clearly in every single message. You will hear about Jesus in every single message because there's always going to be new faces in the room. And I don't know people's background in history. And I don't know where they lie. I don't know if people walked with God for a long time and now they've walked away, but they know how to put on the show of I'm still a believer. Or if they, uh, maybe this is the first time they've ever heard this. And, and so I'm always going to preach that way. But I want to make sure we all understand, Jesus is the answer to all of our questions. There's a lot of answers to a lot of you know, kind of like hang up questions, but Jesus is always the answer, and he answered every single question. You go through the Bible, if you bring up a topic, it's there, the answer's there. The early church preached Jesus and Jesus alone. They didn't have anything else. <laughs> they didn't have all the technology and the, all the things. They, they, they only had Jesus and how God had changed their life. We need to get back to that model. Could you go, you know, rent a massive space, a theater, and, and hire a band and all that? Yes, we could do all that. Um, 
God's not calling us to do that. He's calling us to preach a simple gospel, create fellowship, build into people, build disciples, and then go change the community we're in. Uh, we're going to talk more about what happened to those 3,000 next week. I actually left anyone who knows their Bible. There's a little part of Acts 2 left that I kind of left off. That, um, a lot of people love that part. We're going to talk about that actually next week. But I want to wrap up the discussion with this question. Do you remember the moment when your faith became real and changed your life forever? When was your Acts 2 moment? And maybe you're not there yet, and so that's okay. I'm glad you're here. Um, but let me tell you that the model of the early church is an example of people hearing the good news, believing it, and then their lives never being the same. And so at 21, Danielle and I were dating, and she had this newfound faith, and I was far from God. Like, far from God. I didn't believe, and I wasn't raised in church, and, um, and we're dating, and we're going to get married, you know, right? Like, so you're three years into dating... And all of a sudden, your girlfriend has this, like, change of heart, you know, all the things that go along with that. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what? Who are you? But, but I still loved her, and I was like, well, I'm going to marry you, but we got to figure this out. So Danielle, in her wis amazing wisdom, kept inviting me to events, like Campus Crusade for Christ, like worship night. And then, hey, you should go to this guy's Bible study. And I'm, every time, I was just like, nope, 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 like, come for me. <laughs> It's your thing, honey. Like, that's great. I support you. You know, like, that. yeah, everyone knows that language, right? And, um, and then she knew I loved architecture. I'd taken architecture classes, and there was this uh, campus auditorium. There was a cathedral at University of Florida's campus, right in the center of the campus. Isn't that amazing? When um, colleges were built, they built them around cathedrals. It goes back to the same thing, right? The colleges have moved very far away from how they started. Um, and so this cathedral, she knew I'd never been in it. And so she, in her trickster way, <laughs> said, hey, there's this guy speaking, but it's at the auditorium that you've never been to, but it's like free tickets, so you should come. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll go see it. And so we walk in, it's a beautiful cathedral, and I sit down, and this, uh, this pastor named Clayton King was there. He was a good old southern boy from Tennessee, he ran this massive like, youth ministry. And, um, and that night, um, I'll tell more about the story of what he said a different time. But you have to understand, like, my heart was ready. God had been doing a work on me for a long time. And through Danielle, had really softened my heart. And Clayton, uh, Pastor Clayton spoke a clear, simple gospel message that I had never heard. I had been in Catholic high school. I, you know, had some Christian friends. Um, but for some reason, he presented the gospel in a way that just penetrated my heart and changed everything. Like, I raised my hand. I walked out of there a different person. I was a different person in a moment. And, um, and that may not be your story today, it might not, but, but I want you to remember that moment when that happened and you became different. And then what happened since then? And if that's never happened to you before like that, God is probing your heart right now, like saying that needs to happen. And uh, I walked out of there different. And 19 years later, um, you know, God has done some incredible things and the stories are endless. And kids always love when I tell stories. But I got to always not tell too many stories, but, but 19 years later, I'm the pastor of a church in Wellington, Florida that's just thriving, and people's lives are changing, and it started back at 21, hearing the simple gospel with a heart that was ready, and it changed everything. It changed the direction of my life. I would never go back and, and change anything about it. So we're going to be a church that presents the good news of Christ every single weekend, but I'm going to equip you to be able to do that to your friends and, and do that to the colleagues and workers who aren't going to come here. They might not come here initially. They might actually need you to present the gospel and be filled with the Holy Spirit to go to the ends of the earth, right? God brought the ends of the earth to them. Imagine these 3,000 now all of a sudden going, we're back to Assyria, we're back to the Babylonian exile, we're back to all these places. The gospel spread like wildfire because the Romans had just built the Roman roads and you could travel and the gospel spread. It's the perfect time for all of it. And so I love that. And so we're going to talk about uh, being a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and speak powerfully, uh, but simply, and present the gospel in a way that people can receive it. So let's commit to being an Acts 2 church and standing out and standing up and telling everyone we know about the, the gospel of Jesus. And I promise that if we commit to do this as a church, God's hand of favor and blessing will never leave us. And... Uh, and he'll continue to see this group of people thrive in Wellington, Florida, and make an eternal difference. And when we get to heaven, God's going to be like, I'm so proud of what you did with the good news of Jesus 
telling your friends about it, telling your work, uh, co-workers about it, and heaven's different because of that moment. And so with that, let's pray. Father God, we love you, Lord. We love what you're doing through Good Soul Church. We love your word. We love the truth of your word, and we love that, uh, that you speak clearly to each one of our hearts every single weekend. In that moment I had 19 years ago, Lord God, where, where the gospel was presented in a clear and powerful way, I hope someone received that today. Lord God, that they realize that they are not perfect, they are not ready, but God, you did it all on the cross. And, um, and in a moment, you can change your heart, change your life, turn a life around, Lord God, and bring someone from the pit up into a place of honor, Lord. So right now, I just pray for each and every person in this room that they receive the gospel into their heart um, for maybe the first time, but maybe a renewed sense of what you did on that cross, Lord God. And in that moment, when we make that decision, Lord God, I know the power of the Holy Spirit will fill each and every person so they become bold about their faith, Lord God. They can speak with, with authority about what you've done in their life, Lord God. There's nothing more powerful than a personal testimony. No one can ever take that away about what God can do in a moment. So right now, Lord God, I pray that each and every person in this room, anyone who can hear this message, Lord God, that they, uh, they receive everything you've done for them on the cross, and they walk out of this place with power and strength and might, Lord God, knowing that they are speaking the truth, the best news ever given. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.